Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, starting with verse 1. Hear the word of God. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but not, did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived, and the virgins who were ready went in with them to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Well, we thank you for your, your word this morning, and we ask for understanding the Old Testament reading from Joshua as he spoke to the Israelites about making that covenant, that, that serious decision to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. And then Jesus' message in this parable to be prepared, to be vigilant, to be always ready. Grant us understanding, Lord. Give, give us insight. We pray, Lord, that these words would become a part of our lives, that they would help us to grow spiritually, make progress in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My first year at West Liberty State College back in the fall of 1974, it seems like a long, long time ago, started out bumping for, for a young fellow who, who lacked social graces. Uh, believe it or not, I, I was a very shy lad back then. My parents had just gone through, through a divorce, which of course shook the foundations of my family life. As a freshman in college, I was abruptly liberated from the constraints of a conservative upbringing and released into the sudden flood of freedom offered by campus life. Those of you who have gone on to a public college know what I'm talking about. Of course, my head was spinning back then. I, I was trying to fit in. I was trying to establish a social circle with, with, with whom I could go out and explore this new world that was in front of me. <clears throat> there was an array of temptations that were created before me. The party life, binge drinking, recreational drugs, smoking marijuana, sexual promiscuity, the wild side of, of the college life that, that so many students plunge right into when they get on campus. Peer pressure from my new band of friends carried me along to the local pubs on Thursday night. And, and, and there were a few times when I crossed the, the line of moderation when I went out with them. Deep in my heart, though, I knew that as I, I lay on my dorm bed, contemplating my, my future of life, staring at that dark ceiling above me, I knew that, that this wasn't the kind of lifestyle I wanted to live. Uh, maybe it was those Sunday school days, way, way back when I was a kid, a kid at the Grace Presbyterian Church at Martin's Fair. Maybe it was observing my own family struggle to hold things together as my parents were going through their ups and downs of their marriage. Maybe it was the influence of new friends that I had made. They were committed Christians who were very excited about their relationship with God. 
More than likely, though, it, it was a combination of all these things that made me think more deeply uh, about what I call a blessed lifetime family plan. I began to wonder, what in the world is the secret to a good family, a, a good marriage, loving and caring and stable people and, and children? Why is it some people experience this lifetime of blessings in their marriage and, and their children grow up to be good citizens and loving and caring people? That's what I wanted. That seemed to be so elusive. That, that seemed to be the one thing that, that people have a hard time capturing. So as, as I begin to seek and try to understand what makes for a, a, a good family and, and a long time blessing in that family and, and children, there is one theme that kept repeating itself in my search, and that theme was clearly stated in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, as Israel's leader confronted the people with the decision that they needed to make. And here's the scene. Joshua, who, who of course replaced Moses as Israel's leader right before they crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land, had served as their leader for many years, and now he was old, and he was at the end of his life. This is his last opportunity to press upon the people what he feels should be the fundamental basis of their lives. This is a high-stakes proposition that he offers to them. Not only is Joshua about to die, but Israel's future is in jeopardy as God's representative nation to the world. Unless they can fully grasp the spiritual imperative that Joshua wants to share with them. And so Joshua calls them to the question. And this is what he says. Now therefore fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose for yourself this day who you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now it's Joshua's intent here to rattle the Israelites, to shake them up a little bit, to make them understand that this is something that is not superficial. This is not on the surface, but rather he challenges them to wrestle with this decision at the deepest level of their lives. This decision is going to determine whether or not they are going to be good, strong, solid people and representative of God as a nation throughout the world, or whether they are going to crumble and fall and, and, and wind up defeated. This is going to determine whether they are, are going to create a, a commitment, a covenant with the Lord, or else go in their own direction and give themselves over to the gods of this world, to self-seeking, to self-indulgence, which eventually leads to self-destruction. So Joshua wanted the people to know that this was not an easy decision. This was not a choice to be made hastily. This decision would result in future consequences, possible negative repercussions or possible great blessings. This decision would determine not only the stability of their families, but also the direction they went in as a nation. Here's how the people answered Joshua. This, this is uh, interesting. They said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people whom we passed. 
And the Lord drove out before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. So the people, after considering all that God had done to them for, for them, responded, the Lord also is our God. We choose to serve the Lord too. But notice that Joshua does not let them off so easy. His tenacity to wrestle commitment from them is very, very exacting. He says, no, no, you're just saying that. You don't, really, you don't realize how holy and jealous God is. If your answer is just superficial, if it's just sentimentality, if you're just paying lip service, then your infidelity to the one true God will bring consequences upon you and you will become broken and shattered. Joshua's strategy here had a desired effect. The people responded, no, no, we want to serve the Lord. Really, they seemed to be clear-minded. They knew the seriousness and the gravity of this decision. And they seemed to respond to God with sincere love. Not, not that syrupy, sweet sort of love, but rather the kind of love that is ready to sign on for life. That, that is ready to stick with it for better or worse, through thick or thin. Then Joshua finalized the decision by turning it into a covenant. He said, you are witnesses against yourself, and you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve him. And they responded, yes, we are witnesses. And then comes verse 25. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day. Now what is a covenant? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a covenant as a solemn and binding agreement or promise. But a biblical covenant adds to that this great sense of coming together and, and forming a very, very strong bond with one another. Deliberately choosing to be bound together for life. It's that kind of commitment. Now, as a young college freshman, it, it occurred to me that this kind of covenant in a family, between those who love each other in the family and God, this is what offers that blessed lifetime plan. So there I was as a, as a young man and reading these words, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There on that college campus, I began to embrace that principle, that, that, that spiritual life and life. I was going, going to, to base my future on my relationship with God, and if I was blessed enough to find the right woman and, and have kids, then that foundation was going to be on that relationship with God. So my future family would be upon that relationship to to, to. And, and, and so I realized that whether we would be a strong, productive, and, and caring, and close-knit family was dependent upon that foundation. I remember thinking as a young man, I need to hold on to this. I, 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 I need to be wise and apply these principles and, and embrace them and apply them to my life. Eventually I got married. And as my wife and I began our family and began having kids, we discovered it was not that easy. We discovered there were other essential factors that we needed to consider as time went by because there were storms and rough roads and rocky times. And we discovered the other essential factor that we needed to hang on to to have a blessed family life was that we needed to be vigilant. We needed to be vigilant. We discovered we needed to always be prepared and ready and always
always alert and sensitive to what was happening inside the family, you know, the daily ebb and flow of life with our children and with each other, and outside the family, the influences from society, the media, peer groups. In this world that we're living in, if, if you fall asleep on the job, or if you let things slide, guess what? Trouble manages to get its foot in the door very quickly. We discovered that. And trouble stuck its foot in the door several times. We needed to learn to be vigilant and, and continue to watch inside and outside the family. Jesus told an insightful parable about vigilance in Matthew 25. It's known as the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. There was a big family wedding about to take place. Everybody wanted to be there in attendance. The bridegroom would lead a parade around town to the destination of the wedding, and everyone who joined the parade had to carry a light since it was at night. Well, ten virgins waited with their lamps burning for the bridegroom to arrive, but the bridegroom was delayed, and that happened regularly because he would stop and talk and socialize as he went, so he was delayed. By the time the bridegroom arrived, their lamps had run out of oil. Well, the wise virgins had been vigilant in their preparation. They had been watching it. They thought about it. They knew things could happen. They realized the festivities may not go according to schedule. And so they bought extra oil. The foolish virgins were not vigilant. When things went wrong, they were not ready. They panicked. And they demanded that the wise virgins fix their problem. But they couldn't. There wasn't enough oil. And besides that, you really don't help foolish people by covering them for them. Rather, that just kind of enables them to keep going in the wrong direction. So after missing the procession, the foolish virgins finally arrived at the house and they knocked on the door, but the groom would not let them enter. He also believed in this tough love, or maybe it was just too late. As I look at the world nowadays, man, it is a challenge in today's world for young people to have strong, loving, caring families that stand the test of time. And I know because I've, I've married a few couples and, and several of them are, are divorced already. It's tough. And I realize that in today's world there, there's a variety of families. A variety of families. But whatever family you're, you're coming from, it is possible to be blessed. It, it is possible to have relationships in that family that are good and kind and caring and loving. And the key is for that family to make a covenant of love with each other and with God. And the key is to be vigilant, to watch, because there are so many negative things that can impact that family. But if we make that covenant, and if we are vigilant, then we will be ready and blessed. Amen. Let's turn to the law.